So, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this new uh, Museo GTO online lecture in collaboration with uh, Akime. So I would like just to take a few seconds to thank them uh, for uh, having organized tonight's lecture. Uh, so tonight uh, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Jean Revez from the Université du Québec à Montréal, or UCAM, who will speak about the anastylosis of an ancient monument by evaluating the modern reconstruction of the Hipposal Hall at Karnak. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be introducing uh, Professor Revez uh, to you, and that for uh, two main reasons. First of all, uh, I had the chance to count him as a dear and close friend since we have been knowing each other for more than uh, 20 years now. And, uh, and secondly, also because I myself had the chance to participate for many seasons at the Karnak Hypostal Hall project he is co-directing. Uh, but just before giving him the floor, I would like to highlight a few details about uh, Professor Revez's academic background. So Dr. Revez is professor at the uh, History Department of the UCAM. He has a BA in Liberal Arts and pursued graduate studies in Egyptology at the University of Heidelberg and completed his PhD at the University of Paris-Sorbonne. Uh, he has worked extensively in Egypt, most notably at Carnet, where he joined the permanent French mission of the CNRS as well as uh, excavation teams from the University of Toronto. He is currently the co-director of the joint UCAM and University of Memphis Epigraphic Mission at Karnak. Professor Revez's research interest covers uh, kinship and royal ideology, Nubian's cultural inheritance uh, of Egyptian civilization, as well as new approaches to computerized methods of epigraphic survey of Egyptian monuments, which will surely be a central feature uh, of his lecture tonight. So, uh, Jean, now the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Cedric, for your warm introduction. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to be here uh, as a friend and colleague of Cedric and also as a speaker for uh, the Museo uh, Egizio in Torino. Uh, so today, uh, tonight, or it's difficult to say tonight or today, since here in Montreal it is today, but for you it is tonight, um, I will be speaking of the uh, anastylosis of an ancient monument, the uh, Karnak Hypostyle Hall project. So simply to show you uh, the menu and uh, what we will be dealing with, what we will be talking about, here is the way I see the presentation. Uh, in the first place, I will briefly uh, present the project itself, the University of Quebec at Montreal, University of Memphis project. Then we will turn our attention specifically to the notion of anastylosis, which is the reconstruction of a rude monument from uh, decayed or fallen pieces that are often spread uh, around an entire site, which is the case uh, in Karnak. And for that purpose, I would like to concentrate on three case studies. You will see that I will talk at the beginning of a catastrophe that happened in 1899 of our era, when uh, part of the northern section of the hall collapsed. And uh, it was then deemed necessary to reconstruct uh, the fallen columns together with columns that had already fallen before that time in 1899. So my talk will be structured around these three paradigms. First, columns that were dismantled in 1899 and that have not been rebuilt at all since that time so that uh, concerns column 130 131 i'll show you a map so that you can locate those columns then columns that fell before 1899 and that have been incorrectly rebuilt and finally columns that fell in 1899 and that have also been incorrectly rebuilt so First, a brief look at the project and at Karnak itself. Uh, as you well know, uh, Karnak is located in modern time Luxor and is perhaps the best preserved uh, temple in all of Egypt. It was dedicated to the god Amun or Amun-Ra, which was the head of the Egyptian pantheon during the New Kingdom. And what you see here highlighted or circled in green on your screen to the right 
is the location of the Hattestal Hall. So Karnak is a site of great political significance because it was built over almost 2,000 years. And uh, so really one of the jewels uh, is the uh, Karnak Hattestal Hall. It is also Karnak and the Hattestal Hall a uh, monument of great religious significance because this is where uh, one of the major uh, religious feasts in uh, Egypt, the Opet feast, dedicated to the celebration of the god Amun-Ra and uh, its triad, well, was celebrated and part of the procession took place inside the Hapistal Hall. If you look at the uh, right-hand side, you do see uh, uh, a scene which is uh, shown on the southern end of the hall where you have uh, the uh, Amun-Ra bark which has been uh, transported during such a uh, feast. So just to give you some indication of the uh, proportion, I would say literally the pharaonic proportion of the Hattestal Hall, this is an overhead view uh, of uh, the hall. First, notice how small and tiny the people are. That gives you really a good impression on how uh, gigantic the entire structure is. Uh, here on the right-hand side, you have the north on the uh, Left-hand side, you have the south part of the hall, and it comprises on either side of 61 columns to the south and 61 columns to the north, and 12 central columns that are taller than the rest. The uh, biggest column actually reach up to 20 meter high. Now, just look on the right-hand side. What is supposed to be here architraves uh, are actually pastiche, reconstruction fake architrave. Uh, architraves, you have real ones uh, on the uh, southern end, but on the northern end, following the collapse of the uh, uh, northern half, uh, Le Grain, who was the person responsible uh, in the early 1900s of rebuilding the hall, used these uh, pastiche um, architraves because they are lighter than the old structures that had broken uh, in greater part. Notice also some of the gaps in the columns. You see here, uh, two. there's the room for two columns that have not been rebuilt uh, since the time of Le Grain, and even here in between those two columns, there was another one that stood, and there are two more columns here that have never been uh, rebuilt, uh, although these columns uh, fell at an earlier time than 1899. Notice here also to the uh, south, you have some columns that are partly uh, rebuilt. And so there are three or four rows of uh, capital and even the abacai that are missing uh, in this section. Uh, today, I will not dwell, I will not talk about these um, missing blocks here. I will concentrate on the northern half of the hall. And to end, so notice these two pylons. This is the second pylon. This is the third pylon. And so part of the pylon collapsed and fell over this section, which explains why it is uh, deteriorated. And notice also here outside of the hall to the north, you notice uh, half drums that belong to uh, some of the columns that stood inside the hall. And you will see that there are such uh, loose blocks all over the place in Karnak. So this is simply uh, for the numbering system. It's not really important, but uh, there are 134 columns. So sorry, it's upside down, but I wanted to uh, follow the same direction as in the previous slide. And notice those three columns here. Uh, 130, 131, and 133 that are missing. So those are the columns that stood uh, here on the right-hand side of the hall. So this is the team. Uh, the project began in 2011. Uh, it's a joint venture, a joint project of the uh, University of Memphis 
and the University of Quebec at Montreal. And this is uh, within the general uh, project, which is known as the Karnak Hattestal Hall project, which was founded by William Murnane in the uh, early 1990s. So Peter Brand and myself are the co-directors. Yves Egel from l'Ecole Nationale des Sciences Géographiques is uh, our photogrammetrist. Um, Emmanuel Larose from the CNRS is our architect. Owen Murray, who also works for the uh, epigraphic survey at the Chicago House in Luxor, is our photographer. And uh, Cedric was for us uh, the person in charge of rebuilding the uh, width of photogrammetry, the abacus, among uh, other uh, things. So unfortunately uh, for us, uh, his heavy duties at the museum uh, did not allow him to pursue uh, with us. And we have to mention as well, graduate students from uh, UQAM and University of Memphis that have participated over the years. We have since 2011, uh, organize uh, six seasons in Karnak each time about a month or six weeks uh, at a time. So we have to acknowledge the various uh, organisms that have supported us over the years. Among uh, foremost is the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, but also the American Research Center in Egypt, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and uh, various universities that are also uh, involved uh, in the projects, universities and other uh, academic institutions. So over the years, uh, we have collected data of uh, all the inscriptions that cover the columns fully from bottom to top. Uh, this is really the first time in Egyptian history, architectural history, uh, under the uh, Ramesside kings, uh, Seti I and Ramses II, as well as Ramses IV and the VI, that the columns uh, have been uh, fully uh, decorated with texts and scenes. Uh, so it was important to collate uh, those texts and scenes to take pictures of the columns. And we even had the chance in 2017 of using a drone to collect data for the uh, uppermost sections of the hall that are very difficult uh, to reach uh, with conventional uh, means. So again, for general purposes, study of epigraphy has been one of our goals. Uh, then collating whatever uh, we see uh, with also ancient archives uh, that we have been able to uh, work with, archives from Richard uh, Caminos and from uh, Nelson. Uh, the study of architecture also is uh, of paramount importance and uh, using photogrammetry to be able to do those sections from above and from the side uh, is of great help uh, to us. The, the notion of the chronology of the decoration, you can see on the right-hand side uh, 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 facsimile of the various phases of decoration of uh, each column, and you notice that they have been decorated under uh, various kings, and they even have been decorated under uh, various faces within the reign of one single king. Ramses II, for example, uh, is known to have uh, decorated the hall and the columns in four different phases. So the notion of prime space, which space is first filled up, uh, the notion also of which space, which columns are first decorated, um, are also questions that we have uh, dealt with uh, previously. Uh, two aspects that are specifically important for our talk today is the question of uh, the use of photogrammetry, so this uh, use of both uh, computer science and photography, to be able to unroll the columns. What you see here on the bottom uh, section of the slide is a flattened view of uh, 
the scene that uh, goes all around the circumference of a column. So the circumference for the lateral smaller column is about 6.5 meter and 10 meters wide in terms of the large columns. Uh, and you also have a view uh, up on the upper section of a 3D uh, version of uh, such a, a column that can be played around and manipulated in order to be seen in a 3D uh, environment. So basically, uh, what we have done to carry this out is use data from uh, the scan of the hall that was carried out thoroughly in 2008 when Emmanuel Larose was the director of the French uh, Franco-Egyptian Center, and that data, which allowed for a modeled version of the columns to be created, was used to uh, align the pictures on top of it. So pictures that were taken more recently, uh, our photographer spent months, uh, literally, to uh, take high resolution pictures of the uh, scenes. And here you have basically the process of how it works. You have a mosaic of um, individual pictures that are knitted uh, together uh, to form then this uh, flattened view, a bit like, uh, you know, the uh, transformation of a globe, the Earth's globe into a world uh, map. So this allows to see the entire uh, decoration of the scene at a single glance. So this is a, another uh, example. So all the uh, each individual columns have been uh, processed. So we have uh, such detailed uh, flattened views of the scenes of all 129 columns that are still standing. We also have uh, an orthophotographic déroulé of not only the main scenes that are in the middle section, the middle register of the columns, but uh, of uh, the uh, entire column uh, as such. And this is a 3D model view of the column scenes. So all of this uh, material, uh, all of this data has been uh, processed currently uh, under uh, uh, for, on, on a website uh, in English, uh, it, it will be done on the uh, University of Memphis website, uh, the University of Memphis uh, Hypostyle Hall website, and our own website is under construction, and um, within month, then all of the data will be uh, available uh, online for those uh, déroulés. Another aspect which is important, and this is what has, I would say, uh, taken our attention for the past two, three years at least, is the study of anastylosis, and thus trying to put back the uh, various pieces, there are hundreds of them, and that are sitting on what you see here, platforms that known as mastabas, uh, and that we try uh, at least virtually uh, in the first place, uh, to reassemble and put back into their uh, original uh, location. So this is something that one has to be truly aware of, is how sad the uh, situation of the hall was uh, in the 19th century when it was really neglected and left uh, to its own. So you see here, pictures from the middle part of the 19th century where you could see that uh, the, the hall uh, is in poor state, columns are uh, leaning against one another, uh, the ground is not cleaned at all, so most of the columns uh, are buried. And uh, what happened in 1899, in October of 1899, was that literally uh, 15 columns to the north fell, and a bit like a domino effect, uh, fell on uh, each other and, and then uh, allowed or caused a great section of the northern half of the hall to collapse. So this is Georges Legrain, the head of Karnak in 1895, uh, who uh, was the director then and made the courage courageous endeavor of uh, urgently, um, um, let's say, urgently allowed or, or consolidate the sections that had not fallen, this, this was crucial, and to rebuild also the columns that had fallen. Here you have shots 
uh, first on the left hand side, you see the columns that are leaning on one another. So it's really a domino effect of how the columns just collapse on one another. So it was an incredible mess. Uh, on the right hand side, you see north of the hall, the location where the column drums were laid in row so as to recognize the uh, original location of where they stood. And this is on the upper side here of the slide. You see uh, a mud, big, mud brick ramp that was built by Le Grain in order to clean out the hall and let all the structures be removed. So you see here, a bit like in ancient Egypt, by the way, uh, workers pulling out of the hall part of an architrave uh, in order to uh, then clean uh, the hall, empty it before uh, rebuilding inside it. So these, this is the situation in 1899, basically. This is a map, a sketch made by Le Grain, and those are the situation uh, we will uh, look into. So um, column one, so notice that the numbering system is not the same. So this is the map of Le Grain. What I put here uh, are the numbers that are conventionally used nowadays. This is the, the Nelson uh, numbering. So we will look at uh, first columns. So column here, um, 131 and column 130 that did not collapse actually in 1899, but were dismantled and removed by Le Grain in order to let the ramp be built and enter inside the hall. So it did not fall, but it was dismantled. Then we will look at a uh, column here, uh, 133. And this is actually a column that had fallen before 1899, perhaps sometime in the mid uh, 19th century. So Le Grain took advantage also uh, of cleaning the hall over for uh, removing the blocks of columns that had fallen even before and then eventually attempting to uh, rebuild them. And finally, uh, a third case are the columns here, 102 and 103, that did collapse in October and 1899, uh, that he rebuilt, but you will see with um, let's say, mistakes. So let's look at the first case, the modern anastylosis of the Hattasau Hall at Karnak, columns that were dismantled, so 130, 131 in 1899 of our era, and have not been rebuilt since then. So this is, as I say, the two empty spaces that you see here right next to the uh, northern wall, and you can see where these two uh, columns were located uh, on the map uh, over here. And uh, actually, uh, Louis-André Christophe, who is the only person to have ever written a monography on the columns in a book called Les Divinités des Colonnes de la Grande Salle Postille et leur Epithet, published at the IFAO in 1955, uh, had uh, noticed that the drums were laid outside of the hall but did not took pictures of them or did not uh, really describe them in detail. There's only a short phrase mentioning that. So uh, we then took the, the took a, pursued what uh, Christophe did and uh, looked for all the loose blocks. This is just to show you uh, how astounding it is. Uh, in Karnak, how many loose blocks, thousands of loose blocks coming from dismantled monuments that have not been uh, reused afterwards. So uh, of the hall, basically, most of the monuments are here and just north of it and to the east. Uh, we don't, the, the picture doesn't show uh, the uh, northeast section, but there, is, there are many uh, loose drums there. So th this is a sketch that shows you you the location of the loose drums belonging to the hall. Since Le Grain time, many of these blocks have moved around. Uh, at Le Grain's time, it was all located to the north. Some do, most of them are still to the north, but a lot of them are here to the uh, northeast. Others are over there. So there are five 
various areas basically where those drums belong to the northern section of the hull. And you have also uh, blocks, abakai, and half drums that are sitting to the south of the hull. And these are the ones that belong to uh, the southern half of the hull. So this is a view of one of the platforms to the northeast. Here you have a shot of Owen Murray, our photographer who is flying the drone uh, over uh, the uh, platforms in order to take uh, overhead shots of uh, the platform. So this really gives you uh, an idea of almost like a plan of the location uh, of all the blocks that we were able to number uh, on the uh, picture and to uh, then know exactly which block uh, can be identified with the uh, northern half of the hall. Uh, Owen was even able to build a 3D model uh, using uh, AGSoft Metashape uh, of uh, the platform and uh, with the camera flying over it, it was able, it was possible to uh, have uh, close-up views of the model and, and see, uh, let's say, out of situ though, in Montreal or elsewhere, uh, what the decoration of those blocks uh, were. So, uh, using archival pictures is of a great use um, for trying to find out where uh, blocks were located originally. Here, as you can see from the bottom part of the shot here, uh, this is a shot taken in 1895, so before the collapse of the northern section in 1899. And these uh, are, you, you see columns that you still see today. So also a, a reflex to have one, when one compares old and new pictures is try to situate uh, precisely uh, the location of the shot and from which perspective the photographer uh, took his picture. So here, for example, you have uh, column 132, and this is a modern shot of it. You could see uh, the, the king in the same position, offering the same thing and dressed in the same way. And all the way uh, in the uh, background, you see column 129, which is the column right here. But what you don't see nowadays are those two columns, 130 and 131, that were either fully or partly uh, erected then. So we managed to identify almost all of the blocks of uh, both columns that were in the picture. So here, for example, uh, of column 131, you could see the same type of, of break here and exactly the same text. So obviously the texts are very redundant. So one has to look for details of, let's say, the condition of the stone to be able to really say, well, that's the same block, for instance. Uh, here, this is the block just below that we were also being able to locate uh, right to the north of the Hypostyle Hall. You see the same uh, glyphs from one picture to the next. Uh, here you have also uh, the upper section of Ramses IV offering a bouquet. Uh, you could see here the same um, head and text right above here uh, and another uh, loose block located to the north. And with the help of drawings, for example, Lepsius, who uh, visited the temple in the mid uh, 19th century, uh, we were able to complete or to make assemblies. Uh, here you have to the left the same head of Ramses IV. And then uh, using the drawing by Lepsius to make the connections between the loose blocks here that were, are separated. Um, so what we endeavored to do also in the past seasons is to use photogrammetry in the same way that we use photogrammetry to reconstruct uh, flattened views uh, of uh, the scenes. But this time, instead of uh, using photogrammetry to develop or unflatten entire scenes, we simply unflatten uh, two column drums, as you can see. So they, they fit together, these two drums. So it's the same process as before. 
And also by looking at the two columns from above and putting them together again using photogrammetry, one can see that the circumference of the two blocks fit perfectly, that the dovetails that used to connect both blocks are located at the same, at the right position. So these two loose blocks that in reality are quite a far from one another uh, actually do fit together. So uh, Emmanuel was able to then pursue and use again the same process to put together a bit like loose bandelettes, if you say, loose band-aids, put all these uh, pieces together in the same way that it was done for entire uh, columns and then to be able to reconstruct uh, the scenes uh, and uh, the decoration of column 131. It was also uh, possible to use the same process, but to do a 3D reconstruction of the dismantled columns and then to have a view of what it would have looked like uh, at the time, but uh, using actual blocks and actual pictures uh, of the column. So the same process was done for column uh, 130. You can see here uh, details of the abacus, of the abacus, uh, little holes here that show that this is the same columns that we are dealing with. Uh, the same abacus seen from a different perspective in an old archival picture. Uh, notice immediately under uh, the abacus, you could see part of uh, the capital. Uh, which is actually uh, hewn or engraved uh, in the same block as the abacus. And so we were able to find again uh, the same uh, abacus uh, in the mastabas uh, today. Another picture to show you, but this is a bit more uh, difficult for us to reconstruct because so here you have a modern view of the northern section of the hall. Uh, then an, an older view at the end of the 19th century uh, of the same uh, area, and this column stood 130, but this column no longer stands today. And so uh, the scene here uh, was found through various fragments. So this is where it becomes more complicated because uh, the it is we're not speaking of a complete and quite well preserved half drum, but of various fragments uh, that make up that uh, original half drum. But nevertheless, we were able to uh, locate them uh, precisely. So this is one. Um, task is to rebuild what is no longer there. Then another task is to uh, rebuild virtually uh, what has been rebuilt, but not really incorrectly. So let's have a look at the uh, situation. Uh, here you have uh, another column, so 133 here. And uh, column 133 is mentioned by Christophe has been wrongly put in place where column 119 is now standing. So column 119 is standing uh, right over here. So you see there's quite a gap, so some 30 meters away from its original position. So we wanted to find out, again, he was right, Christophe, but just mentioned this in one phrase without specifying how he came to that conclusion. So we uh, dwelled into... Uh, the picture he showed. So here is the picture he uses to describe it. And with so this is uh, an old picture from 1860. You could see uh, the fallen uh, column here, 133. So this column was standing right here in front of this column, which is 132. And indeed, if you uh, so yes, this is to show that. So he says 133 is now standing here where you have 119. But if you have a close-up view of that column here, 132, you realize that it is indeed the same scene that you see on the modern picture of column 132. So the uh, exact location of the picture uh, is determined. And if you look in the background, uh, you could see the second pylon uh, and today, this is the second pylon, and you see the same 
holes uh, inside the pylon. So there's no uh, ambiguity as to from which location that old picture uh, was taken from. So if we have a close-up view of that fallen drum, uh, we can see the decoration of, of uh, the half drum uh, with the representation of Onohus uh, Shu Ra. And indeed, when one looks at column 119 today, this is what we see. We see uh, exactly that same half drum being located in this re-erected, but wrongly re-erected, uh, column uh, today. So we look at other pictures that Kistov did not look at. This is another view from 133 fallen. And if you look at the inscriptions here, well, you could see that uh, it is the same inscription from another section of column 119, uh, which fit perfectly together. So you have two sets of archival pictures and the comparison of them that really prove that column 119 today is what column 133 was uh, then. And even as the ultimate proof, if one, if one can say, uh, stand in front of column 119 and look in the background, we see exactly the opposite background that we saw in the old picture, meaningly we see the uh, third pylon with the little cavities uh, to uh, put the uh, flag mast, the little niche uh, for the flag mast that uh, were erected uh, there. So this is uh, one then uh, case of a column that had fallen sometimes around the mid 1850s probably and that was re-erected uh, in modern time uh, so at the wrong location now let's look at columns that fell in 1899 so during that big catastrophe uh, of october 1899 and again try to discern uh, the mistakes that were uh, carried down uh, i will later say a, a few words uh, on le grand this is not a call of judgment uh, on the part of myself on the quality of le grand's work as i say he has saved uh, many parts of the hall that would have literally collapsed had he not intervened. But nevertheless, one has to recognize some of the errors uh, carried out. So let's look at column 102 and column 103 that stand in the middle of the uh, northern uh, section uh, of the hall uh, of uh, columns. So this is a uh, column uh, here, 102, 103. And you see it's exactly the same. So the modern day picture uh, shows you the same god, Montu, and here you have Amun-Ra, which stands right in front of him. The uh, Bondo text uh, at the bottom uh, is uh, the same, as you can see. So uh, we can really identify, and even the um, iconoclast uh, let's say, marking or break uh, that was carried on the figures uh, is the same on uh, both pictures. Interesting for uh, scientific sake is to uh, realize how these old pictures are valuable uh, in the sense that they complete lost data. If you look at the old pictures, uh, you can quite clearly read out the inscriptions, whereas nowadays these reconstructed columns, because some of the blocks were in such a poor state that they were not fit enough to be rebuilt, uh, so uh, simply either modern cement was used, so we lose information as to the original decoration, or even as here you have restoration blocks. So these are blocks made of sandstone, but modern blocks that are not uh, decorated. Uh, so they're not the original sandstone block. So if you look at the um, top section here, uh, what you realize is you have a cartouche of Ramses IV uh, that stood in the picture just above Montu, and you have the cartouche of Ramses IV also standing uh, now as days in the same place 
But you notice there's a slight discrepancy. The location of the cartouche in relation to the god is not exactly the same. So it can well be that simply uh, when reconstructing, uh, the blocks were not perfectly put uh, on its axis. And such mistakes uh, can be seen elsewhere in the northern section of the hall. For example, Nelson and also uh, Christophe had noticed that uh, column 96, for example, uh, you see uh, normally it should be sunk relief everywhere, but in this case we have uh, raised relief that was uh, shown on column 96. So the decoration of half drum was literally uh, put at uh, 180 degrees. So it was, uh, the, this is a uh, raised relief is typical of Seti the first. Uh, engraving. So the Seti the first engraving scene was uh, relocated exactly uh, opposite the uh, usual location of such a block. So this is just a, uh, a side uh, remark. So if you look more closely uh, at the two cartouches, you notice that they are not exactly the same. The, the, the inscription seems very much alike, the same stereotype titulatory of the king, but notice the cartouche here inside you have a scepter, the Heka scepter, which takes originally the whole quadrant, whereas here you have the sun disc on top of it, or even the, the figure, seated figure, the mat feather stands on the knee, whereas the mat feather here stands on the head. So literally, uh, it's the block itself that is not located in its uh, right position. So again, this is not something unseen. If you look at the same column that I just showed you, so you, you have here, uh, again, the two gods, uh, um, uh, Montu and Amun-Ra. So at the bottom, you have a flattened view, a déroulé of the entire scene. And notice here, you have at the bottom section, uh, the kilt, which is typical of the uh, pharaoh kilt, the king kilt, and right on top of him you have the two double feather, which is typical of Amun-Ra. So these two blocks do not fit together. They fit um, to different uh, sections of the block. Uh, one can say, yes, obviously with the new restoration block in between, one doesn't notice at first this discrepancy, but nevertheless uh, it is uh, present. So let's look uh, at a more uh, from a further perspective of these two pictures again so you notice so these are the two uh so the same column uh taken uh, at the end of the 19th century with the same scene over here and you have the same scene over here today uh, if you notice it's interesting to it gives you an idea how high uh, the ground level was uh in the 19th century before the uh, hall was cleaned since uh, there's only a small portion of the block that is seen just under this uh, Bondo text here under the scene, whereas today this whole section is cleared and is visible because the earth level has gone down since then. So uh, just look at the background of both pictures. In the old pictures, what you see is a uh, lonesome column that stands in the background, whereas in today's perspective, uh, you have a uh, view of the claustra, which is uh, actually uh, in the central part of the hall. So this shows that the perspective from which both pictures uh, are taken or were taken is not the same, is actually the opposite. Uh, here you have the column uh, here. In the background you have this column, so it means that the picture was taken from the central part of the hall looking towards the north. This is to the north of this column, whereas where the column is standing today, it's the opposite. One has to take a picture from the north looking towards the south, and this is why you see in the middle section uh, the claustra. So this is to show 
uh, let's say, the same view of what it should have been today uh, in comparison with the pictures then, uh, you see that column in the background, which is the same column that is over here. So this is the right shot in both cases, looking from the middle towards uh, the north. So just to show again that, so it means that this column was actually relocated, rebuilt on the wrong side of the axis. It was built then to uh, the uh, east rather than to the west. So just look uh, here. Um, again, you have the two view and look at the column right behind. And let's have a close up of the column. So the column behind is the same in both cases. I believe it's the goddess Sekhmet, which is represented. But again, you see that just in front of the same column, the scene is not the same. So after and before the reconstruction, it's another scene uh, that was built. Now, if you look again at this picture we have uh, analyzed and look across from that same column and look at the column that stands on the other side of that main secondary axis, uh, you see that actually um, the scene is the same uh, in both pictures. So today you have uh, the headdress of the Amunet goddess. You have uh, here this uh, inscription, uh, Mira, which is the same as it was then, the same um, headdress and the same inscription. You can see part of a solar disk here. It's hardly discernible here. And that main break here today is what was the break then. So what it literally means is that both columns were re-erected intravertically uh, on either side of the secondary uh, axis. So let's have a, a, a look now uh, again at this old pictures and look at the number of courses of stones that you have. So uh, you have one upper course that one does not see here, but course number or row number two, three, four, five, six, up to 11. And it's the same here on the picture uh, of the other columns standing right across from it. And let's look at the modern equivalent of uh, the same rows of columns, of, of, of drums uh, on the columns the way they stand today. So you have this same number here of courses of, um, of uh, stones. So just as a starting point, look at a column here 102, which is the same as column 103 today. But you notice column 103, you see the same scene as over here. So it's the same column. But if you go upward, you notice that actually none of the courses of stone above belong to the column today as well. So th this is the cartouche here. You have the cartouche, which is not the same. And uh, if you look at the frieze of cartouche here, and the frieze of cartouche is cut right below the feather, whereas here, uh, not the feather, but the sun disc here, the, the edge of the stone is not the same as the edge of this uh, row of stone. Here you have uh, under so a restoration block. Uh, if you look at the equivalent of uh, row three, where you have the two friezes of cartouche, notice the cartouche with the large solar disc today, whereas then it was a smaller disc, so it was the uh, more complete uh, titulatory of Ramses IV that was shown. And, and then above here, you have, again, a restoration block. The same holds true for the other column. So this is column 103. Uh, again, you have a flattened image over here. You see the Amunet uh, crown. You see the Amunet crown then and now. And if you look at the continuation of the upper section of the column, so the same rows, you see again that there's a discrepancy. Either you have restoration blocks, so modern blocks that are no longer original, 
or you have blocks with different types of cartouches. And this cartouche is not the same cartouche as this one, or the same type of cartouche. And this short cartouche of Ramses and Hekamat Ra of Ramses the Fourth is the short version of the original longer version of those cartouches. So basically, the comparison of the archives with the state of the columns today show that hardly any uh, until proven the contrary, but none of the original uh, have drums uh, of the two columns are put up in their location today. Now, sometimes using archival pictures is not possible simply because certain parts of the columns uh, are not covered by the old pictures. This is the case of the upper section uh, over here. The pictures don't cover this upper section. The pictures only cover this part of the um, column. So if one looks at the top of, again, Column 102, we're speaking of the same column, one of the same two columns we have just spoken about. What you notice is you have recarved sunk relief cartouche of Ramses II on top of an original uh, Seti I raised relief cartouche. So here the cartouche seems to stick out of the stone, so this is typical of raised relief, whereas here the cartouche, the glyphs are sunken into uh, the stone, so this is typical of Ramses II. Normally, one would expect, uh, and, and just to mention, so this is only true, these palimpsests, you call them palimpsests inscriptions, are only discernible on top of column 102. Nowhere else in the northern section here of the hall. Normally, everywhere else in the same section, you have raised relief cartouche of Seti the First. These are examples of such raised relief cartouches. Just as comparison, again, raised relief of Seti the First, the way it should be, and sunk relief of Ramses the Second. You can even discern, I don't know if you could see part of the raised relief sun disc here that was part of the original raised relief sun disc cartouche of Seti the First. So our guess is that since all of the column under this uppermost section of the capital of 102 has been incorrectly rebuilt, well, probably this uppermost section of the capital also must not have been put in its right location. And indeed, when one looks at uh, area, other areas of the hall where you do have the same palimpsest inscription of Ramses II over the cartouche of Seti I, you do have an entire row of columns where such cartouche are to be seen. Here you have examples of such sections. So you see the same spelling of the cartouche name of Ramses II can be seen in both column 102 and in all of those columns that stand in the main east-west uh, axes. So the question is, if it's not there, where should it be put? And in this row of columns, the only column that is incomplete that has uh, that is truncated all the way to the halfway point is column 74. So the guess is that this block in 102 must have stood here on top of column 74. And we were able to find actually the abacus, uh, the square uh, architectural section that stood on top of column 74 because, again, you have the same uh, sunk relief cartouche of Ramses II over an original raised relief cartouche of Seti I in a loose block that stands in the uh, north uh, section of the uh, temple. So um, 
hundreds of meters away from the hall. So this loose block certainly belongs on top of the previous block. And this was a reconstruction uh, using 3D model of where this block should have been uh, located uh, then. So as a conclusion, um, just by looking at those three case studies, we see cases where you we were able to virtually, at least speaking, virtually rebuild uh, columns that are no longer standing nowadays. So this is the case of column 130 and 131. Being able to uh, locate with various archival pictures or confirm what Christophe had seen, meaning that the fallen column here stood there. And what had not been seen before is this mix-up of column 102 and 103, which should be uh, inverted, but also where part of the blocks of the one of these columns, at least, belong to another column there. So it's really like a pastiche column that it was made up of fragments coming from other uh, columns. So we have yet, as I say, to work on this section here. So as a conclusion, um, the importance of photogrammetry and the use of other emergent techniques to help study the anastylosis of the columns uh, is a <coughs> sorry, of paramount uh, importance. Uh, also, uh, the contribution of archival photos to compare the state of the hall before and after its partial collapse in 1899 uh, is of great help. And one has to realize the uneven quality of the modern reconstruction of certain columns inside the hall and need to be aware of potential errors when analyzing the overall program of decoration of the columns. In the 1970s, for example, uh, Wolfgang Helk uh, made a thorough study of the uh, decoration and the position of the gods on the columns but not taking it into account the potential mistakes. So this is something one has to really be uh, conscious of uh, in the future. And as a last point of matter, it's interesting to see how, nevertheless, at least all the blocks belonging to the scenes, although they were not put in the right geographical position, they were assembled together in the right place relatively one to another. It's really the stereotype decoration, which is much more uh, prone to be taken from various uh, other areas of the hall. So simply here as a, as a uh, addendum, uh, there was an exhibit in Montreal uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, showing um, mummies from the uh, uh, British uh, Museum. And uh, during this exhibit, we were able to uh, exhibit two of the déroulés uh, almost in actual size. So you have to imagine that those are the students at UQAM that have actually made the entire process of, of unrolling those uh, déroulés. So it's interesting to note also that uh, such an expertise can be learned uh, by students that are not necessarily trained beforehand for that purpose. And this is another uh, exhibit uh, showing the same. So again, our photographers, um, both Owen Murray and Emmanuel Laos were crucial in training the students. And this is simply recent shots that were taken months ago or, or even less weeks ago. The uh, Ministry of Antiquity has endeavored to clean up the central rows of columns. And after millennia, here it is, colors that are appearing again. So you could just look at the comparison. These are columns that have not been cleaned up. And these are columns where you see the original uh, color springing out. So this is quite fantastic. Okay, so I guess this is it. So if you ever want to read more about our project, so these are publications that deal uh, with it. All right. Well, 
Jean, thank you very much, Professor Vez. That was absolutely uh, an, an amazing talk. And also for me, very interesting to see the, the update of the mission since, as you mentioned, I have been a bit disconnected since a few years now. So uh, what's really striking me uh, at the same, every time really is uh, how much like your, investig your, your, your mission and your work look like uh, looks like a police investigation, really, you know, going from one clue to another, uh, examining and really assessing every single bit of pictures to see for some details and then going from one detail to another in order to reconstruct and to really uh, literally follow the lines of, uh, you know, the, the past work. That is really, really an amazing work. Co congratulations again uh, for all your work. And, 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 and well, you participated in that. Yes, but I mean, it, it's still going on. And this is really uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, we received a, a few questions. Why some dismantled columns uh, were never rebuilt by Le Grain? So bearing in mind, uh, basically, the 130 and 131, for instance. Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, Le Grain was so busy working all over the temple, uh, he also was uh, involved in taking out all the statues in the Cour de la Cachette. Um, he, he had to go probably to the most urgent matters. This is something actually, uh, it's a very good question and something that we'll have to be uh, looking to more deeply. Uh, is really what happened uh, in the 19th century or at the beginning of the 20th century for either some of the blocks, because this is not only the case of Le Grain, because there were other head, other directors that followed him, whether it's Pierre or uh, Chevrier, who also yes. were involved. So this is a very matters uh, to be uh, dealt with in simply with the stability uh, of the foundations uh, of, of the block. But uh, we will have to, to look into uh, the matter of um, exactly, so there are archives at the Louvre that we have been able to, uh, let's say, uh, we haven't really uh, exploited them yet, but we have them, uh, that, that are uh, unpublished notes of Le Grain uh, of everyday life and everyday tasks uh, incarnate, but with a big section dealing with the hall. So we will have to try to see, for example, how the, the chain of command uh, was uh, was organized, mm -hmm. um, who, who was responsible for what part of the task, if we ever find out. Um, we also have a, a, a map uh, of the location of all the loose drums outside of the hall and where they were put into rows. So perhaps by looking at the connections between the proximity of some of the columns, we will be able to also find out why some confusions uh, were made. Uh, I, I know that Azim, Michel Azim has worked uh, quite extensively on, on some of the archives and he mentioned at one point um, problems, friction between the French authorities and the Egyptian workers. Um, so sometimes maybe to uh, more deeply and, and we will have to try to decide why such and such uh, task was carried out, why such task was carried out wrongly, why another task was not carried out at all, such as putting up column 130 and 131 again. But that's a that's a good question. Okay, so uh, I, I jump on, on what you're just saying. Would yeah. it be possible for you in the mission to reassemble them now? So that's that's a, a good question. So the, uh, the possibility are real, uh, in the sense that we have already begun talking with, uh, for instance, Luc Gabold, who is the current head of uh, the uh, French center uh, in, 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 in Karnak, and he's totally uh, for um, rebuilding some of the columns. Now, the question, uh, there, there, there's an ethical question, and then there's a practical question. Um, the first the practical question is, it would be possible, say, to rebuild uh, the total disappeared columns, 130, 131, for example. They're right next to the, the wall. So if you had a crane that would go above it, uh, it would be possible to do it. And there's a gap, there's a hole. So all we have to do is fill in, 
the whole, it would probably be possible, but this we haven't really uh, looked into because the southern section still has yet to be more, uh, let's say, uh, worked on. But probably uh, the, the top two, three, four rows of the columns to the south with the capital could also be uh, assembled. But the columns that had been wrongly reassembled, it would not be possible to dismantle them for security, stability reasons. Um, so we, a monument that lives during the time of its use, but after its use, it continues to be visited and changed. Um, so if you just look at Viollet le Duc and his restorations of uh, Notre Dame or uh, Pierrefonds or other castles in the northern part of, of, of France, the restoration now are part of that heritage. So whether you like Viollet le Duc or not, uh, this is simply history now. It's part of history. So do you want to dismantle this part of the 19th century history uh, not only, as I say, for practical reasons, but even for ethical reasons, I don't see really, or we don't see really the, the purpose or the use of it. Right, absolutely. No, no, you're, 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 nice, nice point that you just raised, John. Yeah. Um, hey, thank you. So, uh, uh, another question. So, uh, is there any connection uh, between the number of the columns and uh, their placement uh, according to the Egyptian religion and concept of the world? Well, I wouldn't be able to say anything about the actual number of, uh, of columns, but I would be able to say that, um, let's say the, the, the location of, of the hall itself in relation to previous monuments uh, is something uh, which has a significance. I mean, the, the hall in the most sanctuary where only uh, priests could go into uh, we know that during the feasts, for example, Opec feasts, or at other parts of, of, of the year, part of the population could enter uh, into uh, the hall and, and see the procession uh, go by. So that would be a, a religious dimension of the use of the hall. The, the, the shape of the columns themselves uh, have significance because they are columns that have papyrus shape. So uh, the, the, the Egyptians were wonderful in imagining, uh, you know, the, the central columns have open bud columns, whereas the lateral columns have closed bud. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so, so, so this has really to do with lighting, because you have to understand that at the time, the hall was covered with a roof, but these side windows, these claustra allowed the, the light to come in uh, with that. And the whole notion of the rebirth also of, of, of the king uh, in, in the Chemnitz, um, Chemnitz, uh, I don't know, I forgot how you, how you say that. The Marsh. Marsh, exactly, uh, in connection with the, the rebirth of, of, of the god and especially of the king, uh, there's also a relationship uh, certainly to be done. But as for the number themselves, I wouldn't be able to say. Okay, okay, fair. You mentioned uh, it took many, many months, but then for, for just one call, how long it takes? Well, uh, it's a long process in, 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 in the sense that we began doing this. First, it was Emmanuel Larose, really, who started, and, and with a French private firm, ATM, uh, 3D at the time. Uh, so at the time, it was on, on, on software, which were extremely complicated, and ATM was probably the only one that was able to, to do it. They, they needed uh, technicians, engineers that knew their software inside out to produce the columns. So this was various softwares uh, allowing for 3D reconstruction, especially uh, with MetaShape, which was uh, AG soft, so 3D uh, before that. Um, then this became more democratized, more user-friendly. And at the beginning, so Yves Egel and, um, and uh, Emmanuel did the work themselves, especially since Yves Egel, our photogrammetrist, developed softwares that he 
let us imagine. And again, it was a bit a prototypal, so he was the one using it. It was a bit it's already existing. Um, then it became something uh, much easier. So at the beginning, it took it was almost impossible to do at least for the students. Uh, and now uh, I would say students do this. Uh, in a couple of hours, three three hours maybe. Uh, wow. uh, one, once the data is is really there, uh, but then there's also quite a lot of corrections to be made. You have to make sure that all the pictures fit together, that there's no uh, contamination, etc. But it's really quite amazing, and 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 so this is where technology leads us. Uh, what was one elitist becomes much more widespread. And uh, so it's always like this. When you introduce something new, it only a few can use it. And then with time, it becomes more popularized, et cetera. It's a, a never-ending uh, circle. Wow. That's oh, amazing. All right. Uh, as I was also uh, w watching, and as you were going through all these uh, wonderful archive pictures that you showed, uh, it also uh, popped in my mind the, the archaeology of the archives. So, uh, is it possible at some point to complete your déroulé, uh, where parts have been damaged, large parts have been damaged, as you were showing, with uh, decorated parts coming from the archive, you know, archive pictures. If you would be able you know, to cut these parts and to stretch them in a way that to embed That's an interesting them in idea. Their... That's an interesting idea. This is not something we have really thought about. We have thought definitely uh, of completing the uh, inscriptions uh, by comparing the old and newer state but this is something that is uh, worth uh, trying i don't know if, it, if it's practically possible but i guess it it, it, sh it should be but the the idea is good but yes um, at least what we want to do uh, in on our website is include uh, archival pictures that would allow the user uh, to then complete the information and, and see, um, you know, columns in a, in a better state than what uh, it is today. So, yes, yes, that's a good, that's a good point. Cool. Well, well, yeah, it would, I think it would depend also on the resolution of the scan, if you were, you know, able to, as you were saying, to, to, to really embed them. That would be well, it. Oxford was uh, very kind uh, to lend us a couple of their uh, archives, and, and it was high resolution. So I think it would be possible uh, using those archives to, to do that. So I'm looking forward. And... Uh, Thinking, bearing in mind also of looking forward, uh, do you have any scoop for uh, you know the future of the mission? Any what are the future plans uh, of the well, mission? Well, the the future plan is uh, there are various. So, so the future plan is then to put everything on site so that people can use it both. Uh, Egyptologists and, and lay people. Uh, so that's an important task. The other task is then to really uh, publish uh, more standard books. Uh, up to now, the Epigraphic Survey has been the publisher. Um, in 2018, for example, Peter Brand published with Erica Fellage and uh, William Murnane, but he was already dead. Unfortunately, he had passed away. Um, the uh, scenes inside the hall, but that were hewn on the walls. So uh, we would do something like this also for the translation uh, of the text. There will definitely be our, our I would say our foremost uh, priority is to try to do as much as we can do online, even in terms of translation and in terms of um, uh, analysis may be more difficult, but at least a basic translation, a bit in the same way that the Saint franco Egyptian is doing currently with its uh, inscriptions. Yes. But we would add also then the archives that would allow us to complete uh, the, um, uh, the inscriptions. And um, also because simply uh, today the, the, the funding organism, whether in Canada or in the States, try to favor as much as possible uh, open access uh, data so that yes. it's not confined to a few people that are specialists, but so that the results of the project can be really uh, spread 
to uh, the most possible, the largest audience uh, possible. So that's it, one thing. So more specifically, color, obviously, we will take, uh, so this uh, winter, should, this December, Owen Marie should be able to take colors, the, 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 the newly cleaned um, columns, while the colors are still bright and beautiful, so that we have really archives for this. Uh, we will try to actually do some déroulés using those color scenes. So it will only be for the scenes. He will take probably shots of everything, but not close-up shots from, from the entire columns. And, and as I say, then uh, looking into Le Grain and the why of or the process of what has been done in the rebuilding and finally the actual reconstruction. So uh, we, we have just... Uh, submitted a new grant uh, for the next five years um, to the uh, Canadian Research and Humanities Council. So we will see and wait uh, for spring if uh, we are able to uh, receive the grant. But definitely there are, there's a lot to be done. Great. Well, fingers crossed for the future. Absolutely. We wish you uh, an absolute best of luck. And Thank you. Uh, as I see no questions, new questions are popping in, so I would just uh, need to thank you again for uh, your time and for uh, well, this Well, thank nice you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great pleasure for me to be in Italy for a couple of hours or an hour and a half, uh, virtually, since this is a virtual talk, so we might yes. as well use technology. And, and uh, so thanks to you for the invitation. Thanks for the, the museum. And uh, all the best to uh, you and everyone in turn. Thank you. It was really an honor to have you here uh, with us. Thank you very much. Thank and goodbye. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. And you too. Take care. Bye-bye.